Hello, one and all, and welcome to the podcast we call The Fantastical, with myself, Stephen Nussbaum, in the podcast where I invite my guests to come on and talk to me all about their musical tastes, their memories, their experiences, and they get to collate their fantasy festivals, which I have christened Fantastival. We are now on episode number 113. We are now in December, and the holidays, they are coming. Before we start with this one, a massive thank you to A.D. Hansen, who was my guest for the 112th Fantastival podcast. Great guest, great guy, a real driver of new music. If you haven't listened to that one, please go back and check it out. Great lineup, loads of new acts uh, that he recommended who are well worth a listen to or follow on Twitter. So make sure you get involved on that one. So that was 112. This is 113, the penultimate Fantastical podcast of 2020. And I'm delighted to introduce this gentleman live from Tokyo. It's just gone four in the morning where he is. I can't quite believe this. That's right. It's producer, songwriter, excellent all-rounder, I'd say. It's Joe Aidmar. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on, Steve. Cheers. Joe, thank you so much for coming on. I can see uh, by doing this on Zoom, it's the night where you are. You've got a beautiful view. How's Tokyo? It's dark. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, to, to be honest, I, I've stuck mainly to UK time, so I'm a bit of a night owl uh, whilst I'm out here. So it, it's not as bad as it sounds having to get up at 4am, because as you know, it's 7pm where you are, and I, that's where my brain thinks it is, to be honest. Great stuff, great stuff. You've got a lovely view. We're about to have a lovely podcast. And before we talk all things music, I always like to check in with my guests from a mental health perspective. It's been a random two and a half years, three years now. Just like to make sure everyone's okay. So, Joe, how have you been, mate? Wow, uh, good question. I didn't expect that one. Um, to be honest, I think I think most... I, if, if you look at the, the title of my penultimate album, there's a clue there. I, you know, and it was called Existential Dreadlocks. So, um yeah, I, I occasionally get down, but right at this moment, yeah, things are positive. Um, the family are doing well, and, you know, and I've got a lot of good friends around me whenever I do feel a little bit blue. But yeah, on the whole, things are good. Thanks very much for answering. How about yourself, Steve? Not bad, not bad. I'm looking forward to Christmas with my family. Jobs all good. Friends are all good. Can't complain. I'm speaking to another wonderful person on this lovely podcast, so I'm a very happy uh, 42-year-old not young man, middle-aged man, shall we say, as we record <laughs> as we record this. So, Joe, I've obviously int- introduced you as a producer, songwriter, a great artist. In case anyone's listening who doesn't know too much about you, tell us a bit about yourself. Who is Joe? What does he like to do? A bit of, bit of uh, your story. Well, when you, when you introduced me, it was, it was quite nice to hear you use the word producer first because ultimately I think that's where I see myself, really. I, you know, I've got a lot of stuff out on on all the streams and on Bandcamp, you know, I think, and I've got, you know, my sixth album in the pipeline. So I, I do a lot and I put a lot out there, but ultimately where I, if you were to ask where I want to be in a couple of years, it would probably be more producing others because, you know, I'm the wrong side of 50 and it's hard work. If you really want to make it as, a, as an established act, you, you've got to be out there gigging all the time and I'm too old for all that. And I, you know, and I got that, that side of things out in the twenties, now I am really just, um, and so I see the the music that I put out though is it's more of a showcase really to to say you know if you want my help if you want my assistance in in sort of bringing forward some of the songs you got yeah you know, I'm someone that you can consider so that's that's how I see myself as someone who can remix or maybe go a little bit further into people's demos and and offer you know melodic alternatives and and help them out with with parts that maybe they haven't done as as strongly as they possibly could. So that's yeah, a traditional producer. So what yeah. came what came first? In has it always been producing, and the songwriting's always been there, or did it start with songwriting, and then your kind of interest is gauged more into the producing side? So I, I I got the proper bit of kit in the beginning of the two thousand um, in two thousand and three. I remember because I, I got a promotion, and um, it, that promotion was a significant amount of money for me, and I did what. I think was the most cliched thing and I went down to the car showroom and I had a couple of test drives of you know fast little things and I and I wasn't really that fussed by it all and I thought I still got to spend it on something so I, I nipped down to a music shop down in Brighton called Absolute Music and I and I just sat there for two or three hours with their pro audio guy and just said what do I do I mean I want to write songs and record songs a bit better than I currently am on this crappy little PC that I had from PC World and <laughs> He introduced me to the world of um, the Apple Mac, and I, and I got myself a, a Mac Pro at that time, and it was a, it was a significant investment. And um, so from 2003 until 
January 2020. It was something that I was I would always call you know a, a, a really fulfilling hobby. And um, but we all know what happened in January 2020. We got the opportunity to take things a little bit further. And, and I so I sort of graduated from from that point onwards with all this spare time that particularly with the business that I was in. Um, and I invested my time wisely, and I, and I sat down and I and I read. I, inv- I subscribed to a couple of um, tutorial companies that could teach me how to do mixing a little bit better. And I kind of popped out at the end of 2020, and I put a couple of albums up, and and I and they they're all right. You know, the songwriting's all right, but the mixing's a bit sort of low key. It's not it's not really good enough. But the acceleration in learning as you, as you, you know, you get the opportunities to maybe remix other people, work with other people. And, and I did produce a few people that, that were a lot further back, you know, because I'd started it 20 years ago and I, I brought them up a little bit further towards where I felt I was at. And, and all that time, it's just uh, just a incremental gains of knowledge and how to do these things. And I'd like to think now, probably the last album I did is I, I'm starting to feel like I'm on par with what would be, a, you know, a decent standard of of production value as they call it you know so the the mixing's good enough I'm, i think i'm on top of how you master songs and then when it comes to songwriting that's well that's i i can't really talk about that that's, that's the beauty in the eye of the beholder i'd like to think there's quite a few songs i've written in the, probably the last couple of years i'm proud of but you know it, uh, I, i'm going to stop talking now but, yeah it's only the production <laughs> side you know i've, I've learned a lot on production that's for sure yeah. And, in, and in terms of producing, then, I'll, I'll kind of start with the producing and we'll go into your own stuff. I know you've produced Mind Aid, which was basically around this time last year. I hadn't helped get that track together, which was a host of unsigned new music acts all singing Band Aid with slightly different words, uh, which was a fantastic. I know as well through uh, contacts on the podcast, you work with Distant Images and remixed Echo a few months ago, which was fantastic. So congratulations to you uh, and the guys on that. That was a fantastic piece of work. Who else have you produced and worked with from a production point um, of view? There's a, a lad called Joe Peacock from Birmingham. I, we, I did nine-tenths of um, his Sorry. penultimate album, and, and that was great fun. Joe, Joe was a guy that was putting things together with, with Garage Band and um, and he sent me track by track and we did it over quite a few months and and, and I would like to think that the what I added to, to, to Joe's music elevated it. At the same time I, Joe's a very he's a very interesting songwriter. He comes up with some very weird stuff and it works. Uh, and I and I really like he's a very tenacious um, sort of guy. So I learned a lot working with him because the hidden side of when you produce people is is how you you get around the songwriter's ego, and I, and I, and and Joe is someone who doesn't have a particularly big one. But I always had to kind of understand what he wanted from the song, and and sometimes, I'd, in his opinion, I'd ruin it. So I, I learned how that the relationship you have with with um, a musician and, and and trying to find that sweet spot so that you've changed their song to to improve it, but at the same time you haven't destroyed it in their their opinion because they're so attached to it. They've got that sort of muscle memory about this, how the song was when they first wrote. I've done a remixes for the Raz. Um, I did one for Luca. I've there's Mantra Ray. There's a, I've got one that's probably I think it's been called Finish, which has got a brilliant chorus. Um, I'm probably going to miss a few. This is where I'm going to I'm going to regret. But that, there's probably about three or four I was throwing now. Yeah, I did one for um, Opalo right at the beginning. I mean, and then the last four that I've mentioned have all been done on the pseudonym of um, the Invisible Squirrels. So they're they're more dance dance music oriented i forget sorry arcade state i did one for them as well um up in glasgow yeah so i think that's uh, that's everything listed i think i hope so no mikey J. it's a fella out in australia i did one for him as well i'm gonna stop listing you, you speak, <laughs> if you speak. <laughs> great stuff esteemed company another mention for arcade state on this podcast who doesn't love arcade state fantastic band so Great work on the production side of things. And then from your own songwriting perspective, you spoke about a little bit since January 2020, you've been fairly prolific, right? Because there's a lot of material that you've done and recorded. And your last album, About the Soul, has been available on Bandcamp, but comes out to stream on Tuesday the 6th of December. So you're adding even more material to, to stuff you've already got. I mean, how, how have you been so, I guess, prolific is what is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think the the first two albums in 2020 um, were me ploughing the vaults from the previous 15 years. Right. So I, I think if you went into the folder marked songs on my computer, it's probably going to be about 300 in there. And, you know, I 
being a little bit OCD, I probably I think I marked them all, you know, red, green, or orange, and I just went through all the ones that were the greens, you know, at the beginning of 2020. So I, having plundered those, I think that I've exhausted that supply. So from 2021 onwards, with the exception of a couple of numbers, there's it's all been new stuff. Um, and why, you know, to answer the question about being prolific, so I think if you add up the Together with all the, you know, the album counts, I think I've got about 60 tracks under my name and then about another 25 under the Invisible Squirrel. I've got a lot of time is the one, one probably the most important factor. And I've got a very patient wife, Sarah. And then number two, I think that the, the speed at which I work, I think is as a consequence of, of, of working with my particular digital audio workstation, um, which is Logic Pro. So I'm, I'm a whiz. I know all the, the shortcuts. So I understand how to set up a mic quickly. And, you know, if I've got an idea, I know exactly where I'm going on the studio. So, you know, that point where you end up and you think, I've got a finished demo, how do I flesh it out into a finished track, mix it up, and then ultimately master it? That can will probably take me between one and two days. But what I I will always do is like I never say well that's finished. I will I will park that. I'll move on to the next track. And what I have is this continue revisiting. And and this is my recommendation to anybody who feels the impulse of releasing things too quickly is that you you, you have to sit on things for months um, because you you know you've got to go out and make yourself a coffee in the morning and listen to it and then hear just one or two little inaccuracies so that you can return to it and go back. And that's, that's, I'm, I'm probably most songs that I eventually put out will be on about mix 20 and 20 different iterations. And, and sometimes they've been completely written and I've deleted the whole lot. But if you're doing that all the time, eventually you're accumulating this sort of cyclic number of tracks of probably about 30 or 40 tracks that you're constantly trying to refine until you get to that point where you can finally say, right, I think this is done. This will go on the next album. And, and that's basically where I've been at for about the last 18 months. So this next album, I've got another one in the pipeline, is currently sat with 12 tracks, and I'm ready to stick it on Bandcamp probably sometime in February, March. And um, and I'm feeling that it's good to go, but I'm not, because everybody you know close to me knows that you know there might be another two more songs that can just replace those ones that are 90%. But this, this album that comes out on the 6th, this, this has been, it was finished in May. And it went out on Bandcamp in July. And the reason why it went, I finished it in May and it went out in July is if you give eight weeks' notice to Bandcamp and then you pitch it to them, they have an editorial team and they will listen to it. And if they like it, they will then stick it on their website. And you'll be what is one of probably five or six per day, which are called New and Notable. And then you go on their homepage for a couple 48 hours. And I was lucky with, with the, the album that comes out on the streams uh, in a week or two. Um, that got featured, so that that was a real big win for me this year. And it was, I believe, the quote, Joe, was ut- I do my research, you see. I believe the quote was <laughs> utterly bewitching electro pop with sublime vocal melodies, recalling the glorious theatricality of eighties new wave. That that is an amazing sentence that Baron Camp have put against uh, against the album. Yeah, I mean, the, the guy that emailed me to tell me that I I got through is the director of editorial. So I spent about a month knowing that, that in two weeks' time it, it was going to be featured, thinking, oh, this is the most elaborate spoof from my mates I've ever known. <laughs> but it wasn't until that tweet came out when I finally thought, shit, this really has happened. So, I, God, it, it has been... That moment, that July, was, was so wonderful for me. It was one of the most... Actually, probably the most Im- impressive thing that I've ever happened to me, you know, as far as music's concerned, yeah. Oh, massive congratulations. Massive congratulations. And if anyone's listening at the moment and can't wait to stream it, they can go on Bandcamp right, right at this very moment, search for your name or search for About the Soul and they can purchase an album, right, if they want to. Yeah, yeah it's on there. It's on, it's on um, both the digital download, but it's also got vinyl and CD as well. So um, it's good to go. Brilliant, brilliant. Looking forward to hearing it and looking forward to probably purchasing the copy and falling in love with that album as well as your others. So, Joe, what your albums all sound like there's so many different influences and sounds and different things going on. What type of music are you into? What what do you listen to at home? Um, I'm... I am because of you know the circles that we move in. If we're we're trying to get our own independent music out there, I, I do listen to a lot of people that are in our sort of community that we it's kind of centered around Twitter. So um, I'll start off with all the people that are unsigned. The obvious ones, I, I'm I think Dictator, uh, Heavy North. As far as bands, you know, I think Arcade State as well. 
the Ra's. And then when you've got all the solo musicians, there's, I'll tell you why the first one is just burst out of nowhere. It's a guy called Grim 17, who I, he was just this comedic Irishman who does this random tweet every morning where he drinks a cup of coffee and just talks random bollocks. And he's funny. But I, I eventually got around to listening to his album uh, a week ago, and it is astounding. I mean, he is, if you're looking for, you know, the full complement of, of production standards um, as well as songwriting, and and and, it, and he's he's got some really decent lyrics. So I recommend if you seek him out. Uh, and then you got you know the obvious people. I think Luca is he's, he's he's the most rock star type rock star guy we've got going amongst us. Uh, who who is the only one who's actually nailing the bit about not giving a fuck. There's a few pretenders, and we, I'm, I'm not going to name names. But there's one or two trying to do that sort of, like, fuck all of you sort of thing. And, and we know that it's kind of blowing up in their faces, but Luca has always done it with Panache, so I'll take my hat off to him. There's um, obviously, I think, the, the um, and it comes as no surprise, because so many of us are, I'm a massive fan of Sylvie. She has, I mean, the fact that she has not had really anything in the way of singing lessons is astounding. Because she's got a voice that has just got so much power and energy, and she's a pretty decent songwriter, and she's got it all going for her. So it's lovely. It's really going to be interesting to watch how she progresses in 2023. I'm probably going to give a shout out to a band that have gone dormant because um, they're lead singer out of Baby, and that's Silverheart. And I've also there's a bit of bias there because I'm hoping to produce their album when they eventually get around to it. <laughs> but admittedly, Tom, their lead singer, he's, he's been up to his eyeballs and nappies for the last uh, three months, six months, actually, no, five. Then you got Skydiving Penguins. They're decent. Have you ever heard their album? I mean, that's a direct question to you, Steve. I, I know of them, but haven't heard their album, but we'll go and listen to it now. And Silver Heart, yeah. I have had a few back and forths with, and they will be on the podcast at some point, probably in 2020. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah they're solid musicians, um, those boys. Yeah, West Lothian, you know, there's, there's a little hot spot of all these people coming out of that part of the world. So I kind of, yeah, that, I'm sort of running out of names now. I, that was, I probably overdid it there. But nice. they're, they're, the, they're the people who are unsigned that I'm into. I'd say of bands that are sort of signed, that are sort of contemporary, um, I'm a massive fan of Pine Grove, who are a sort of um, East Coast band. Um, it's sort of out country. Singer's got quite a shrill voice, which is kind of a bit like, you know, some people can't stand how Neil Young sounds, but I, I actually love his voice. But the band themselves, I think, are the best bunch of musicians I've heard in, in, in North American music for quite a while. But they don't seem to be catching fire. Oh, you can't really explain these things, can you? Um, and then for the, the bands I'd probably mention now might ruin the format of the rest of your podcast so i'm going to stop there all right we'll stop you there but you mentioned some great acts and i agree with everything you said about the unsigned acts some superb talent uh, out there which is great to see so joe let me take you back to when you were a younger a young boy a bit of money ready to buy your first album or your first single to buy your first music do you remember what your what it was and that experience of buying that see i know that the temptation would be to to say something really cool here um, but I'm going to be honest, and I, and I know that the single I bought is cool, but the album I got isn't. And so the, the single, the first single I bought with my Woolworths vouchers from my grandma, uh, in probably it was 1981, was uh, Ultravox Vienna, little 45, nice. um, and that that was the first. So I kind of feel like I get a brownie point for that. But I let myself down <laughs> by buying 12 gold bars by status quo it was my first lp um which uh, you know it's a decent album but it was kind of considered naff within a few years of doing that but yeah that, that was the first two that i got yeah i think that's fine three chords can't go wrong with with the quote chords can't go yeah, wrong with the quote chords. Yeah. <laughs> so, so joe, joe this is podcast it's all about you collating your fantasy festival are you a big festival fan have you been to many yeah, my it's not really a claim to fame, but I've only been to Glastonbury once, and the way I got in was um, by uh, being a bit naughty. It was before they managed to sort of make the whole festival thing completely impenetrable. So it was in it was in '95, and what I did is my mate gave me a little leg up, and I stuck my head over the edge that perimeter fence, that sort of the one that would be about eight foot high, and I saw a bloke in a tabard, and I just said to him, I said. I hope you don't mind me asking this, mate, but what is the going rate to bribe someone who's on security? And he just turned to his, his governor behind him and he went, oh, 20 quid? And I went, all right then. <laughs> so I ended it. <laughs> went, over, went over the side and I, and I just spent, um, you know, without a tent to camp in, um, about 36 hours wandering around in, in a daze like you do at, at Glastonbury. But, um, yeah, my, my the last festival 
proper festival I went to, as far as a whole weekend, it's been a while. It's been a while, but I've been to the odd uh, all day. Uh, um, but yeah, I think the best festival I ever went to was 95 Glastonbury. Yeah. Great shout, great shout. And again, no spoilers, but do you have a favourite gig? And if you do, can you share it without spoiling your fantasy? I can, actually, although it's just a coincidence. Um, yeah, I saw before, it was three weeks before the Benz came out by Radiohead. I had a I had a pair of tickets to see them at Oxford, um, and it was then called the Apollo. And I and I watched them perform the whole of the Benz before the album was wow. out, so it was all new. And they were supported by Supergrass and Ride. Um, so I got sort of three decent bands, and it was quite a moving experience really because uh, I was one of the few people that would sort of had Pablo Honey before they became big with their successive albums. So I was raving about them. And I think Pablo Hanni at that point only sold about 25,000 copies. So I was like definitely an early adopter of the Radiohead sound. And um, so that was that was the one. So that, that is probably the, the gig of all gigs that I've been to. Sounds incredible. Sounds incredible. Could almost be a fantastical or 60% of a fantastical, but I guess I guess we'll find out. So like I said, at the top of the pod, this is all about getting our guests to collate their fancy festivals. So Joe gets to choose any five acts, one of who must play one of their studio albums in full and an encore to all five of his acts to perform together at the end of his fantasy festival, which can be any song by any act that his five acts can perform. So like I said uh, at the beginning, thanks to A.D. Hansen, he was in my last podcast. He collated his umbop. This is the one fantasy festival as follows. So very clever there what A.D. done. In his opening acts, he had Bears Den. In his super second act, he went for the Cranberries, who made their fantastic uh, debut. So that was good to see. Midway Madness, AD picked the Prodigy pre-headline act. He went for REM. And in his headline act, AD had the Stone Roses play the Stone Roses album and uh, all their other hits as well. And for his encore, he had all these five acts play Love Will Tear Us Apart. So very simple concept, very simple premise. But before... We can talk about your acts, Joe. We need to give your fancy festival a name and we need to give it a venue. So, Joe, what are you going to call your fancy festival? Well, yeah, I'm glad I got advance notice of this question. And uh, the thing is, I'm choosing, having asked you whether it's OK, uh, a few acts that probably can't because they're no longer with us. So I'm going to call the festival Reincarnation. I like it. I like it. And I guess that is pretty much an obvious title, I guess based on your acts. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm good for obvious. That's one of my, my strong points. <laughs> so, Joe, reincarnation can take place anywhere. You can, We can hold it in Tokyo, where you are now. We can hold it in London, where I am. We can hold it back in the Oxford Apollo, uh, which is what it used to be called. We can go anywhere in the world for reincarnation. We will follow you for this festival. But where do you want to hold your fantasy festival, Joe? I think yeah, the best crowds from from watching all those sort of videos when you got this stadium gigs with one of these big power players is it seems like the south americans are pretty good uh, at having a party so you know i think the, the perfect place would be something like rio or buenos aires or something like that but i think it's important to, to say that it, it there needs to be a train station next door because that's the problem with a lot of these places that you, you, they, you they don't have a very good network of transport so that would be the ideal place anywhere in the world with a south american crowd Right. Let's do it. Let's go to Rio because we've never been to Rio before. I had uh, Gallagher's Green on, and we went to Buenos Aires uh, for them a couple episodes ago. So let's go to Rio, and we'll keep it in South America. Sounds like a great place. So we've got reincarnation. We're going to Rio. It's going to be a great day, but you can only take five acts. But before we go through the five acts, any acts who you want to mention quickly, who you love, but just for some reason or another, just haven't made it into your reincarnation fantasy festival. Yeah, it's probably going to be Peter Gabriel purely because I've, I love the way that he's approached music sort of in the last 30 years. He, he sort of has this sort of benevolent touch. He's got all the money in the bank. He's got a brilliant studio down in the West Country and he just brings people in from all over the world just to try things out. And and he's also a fantastic songwriter you know, with a brilliant voice. So the only reason I wouldn't put him in is um, is the fact that his ticket prices for his recent tour that he's just announced are so ridiculously expensive. I, I, I had a look and I thought, well, if you want to be in like, you know, the front 20 rows, uh, um, I think it was the O2, or whatever they call it, the old Millennium Dome, yeah. it's, not, it's 450 quid. So I'm thinking, mate, you lost touch. You can't do that. That's insane, isn't no, it? Let the tout scalp us, not, not the artists themselves. I'm not happy with that, but, you know. Million percent. So Peter's suitcase is packed, but he's not coming. He stays at home. So reincarnation yeah. is ready. We've sold it out. 
There's a mental Brazilian crowd already. It's two o'clock. So, Joe, who's going to open reincarnation? See, like, this one, when you're doing the what I would call the graveyard slot, and trust me, I've done a few of those where you sort of play into a crowd, you know, about seven people and their dog, you know, before everybody turns up at four. I'm going to go with um, public service broadcasting because, you know, people aren't ready to dance at that point. What they want is a big sonic experience. And I think as far as, as that band goes, they, they have nailed it. They've spent the last five, well, ten years releasing albums that have sort of changed the way, you know, you can listen to music where it's, it's a combination of the spoken word as well as real sonic majesty. So if you're going to lie on, the, on, a, on your little blanket out in the sun with your second or third pint of cider, I think that's, that's the band that are going to, you know, take you there so you're enjoying the experience. Great shout. So public service broadcasting is going to open your fantasy festival. First time they've ever been chosen for a fantasy festival. So lovely to see a new name into the fantasy festival roster. They get to play from 2 to 3 o'clock. We're going to take a half hour break for more cider, more soft drinks, whatever people want to have, they can have. And then it'll be time for your super seconds act at half past three. So Joe, who's going to be your super seconds act? Well, purely because of his front, the front man and the fact that he can keep people energised um, in a, in such a homely way. I think he's one of the best sort of orators uh, as a front man. He, he's just the only person that can genuinely have everybody loving him, you know, just at the moment he just starts speaking. And that is Guy Garvey. So I'd have Elbow playing that bit where we're just, you know, the sun's just thinking about setting, but still it's not quite the party going. I think Elbow would just get everybody, uh, you know, moving to the next level before the big acts start to hit. Great shout. Anything you would, obviously they've got their big tracks, but Elbow obviously released a lot of stuff before they got big. Anything you'd want to hear Elbow play that people might not be aware of necessarily? Yeah, Newborn. Yeah. That, that off the, the, I remember hearing it. I got the Red EP, you know, before they, anybody had heard of them. And, and and I was, again, like with Radiohead, I was really early on. And they the Newborn was was a track that was on that, that I think it was their first EP. And it's just such a, a great growing song and, and kind of musically curious. You know, Elbow have got a lot of tricks up their sleeve. I appreciate that they, they have completely nailed the anthemic, you know, arms yeah. out wide sort of thing. And and But, yeah, their early stuff is is... is Fantastic. You know, Elbow have never dropped to drop the ball ever, in my opinion. Great shout, Joe. Elbow, their first fantasy festival appearance. So they're going to make their fantasy festival debut yeah. in your super second slot. Guy and the boys play from half three to half four. We'll take another half hour break. That'll take us to five o'clock and it'll be time for your midway madness act. So, Joe, who's going to be your midway madness? So I'm, I'm now in, in the dead person's part of the, the festival <laughs> where I, I, it's just, well, you know, you do call it a fantasy. So um, I'm, I'm going to invite um, Talk Talk to come and play. And I, I, if you know, it's just one of those, if you know, you know, Talk Talk started off in that synth pop era and they were competing against um, some very pretty boys like Duran Duran and, and Spandau Ballet. And for some reason... Around that time in the 80s, the, the music industry sort of wanted to bundle in Talk Talk with them. So they got off to a bad start because they weren't really that type of band, but they had quite heavily featured synths and a lot of the percussion on it was, was quite electronic. When they got that out of the way, they sort of pissed off into into the wilderness for quite a few years. And they came back with um, with the album uh, Colour of Spring. And then following that, again, two or three years later, they um, it was Spirit of Eden. And, and those those two albums, for me, still are you know, in my top ten. And I think until recently, yeah, I would put one of them at, at my number one. So, yeah, that would, again, it's not, we're not quite at party stage, but I'm just, my last two acts are going to bring it back up for you. But I think Talk Talk would be great. Great shout, Joe. Maybe unsurprisingly, maybe not. First time Talk Talk playing a fantasy festival on this podcast so we've got three new acts i love it so talk talk make their fantastical podcast debut they're going to play five till six midway madness one more half hour break takes us to half past six now it'll be time for your pre-headline actor we're going to get an hour and a half to play they're going to play from half past six to eight o'clock so joe who's going to be your pre-headline act again um the exhumed david bowie um it's it's i think bowie is um it's it, I, all I imagine is anybody hearing me say that he's the pre-headline act is who the hell is going to be first, yeah. and 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 hopefully when I say that it's going to make sense purely because of um, 
I want people dancing for the last couple of hours at this festival, but what Bowie can do is move everybody to tears. And I think if we could get him back for just a couple of hours, it would be an epic experience for everyone. So um, that's my man, Bowie. And, there, and it, it's no no need to explain why. Absolutely. Anything you would want to hear him play? Because obviously he's only got an hour and a half and he could, he could do a whole day by himself. And I always ask this question to people who pick David Bowie because it's never the same answer. So what would you want, what would he have to play for you, Joe? Uh, you would have to trawl through most of the stuff that came out in the 70s and early 80s. Um, yeah, a Hunky Dory album and, and, and heavily featured um, and Aladdin Sane. But yeah, if I was going to pick one track, funnily enough, I've read your, 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 your pro forma for how your podcast works and I'm going to use one of his tracks as the encore. So we'll come back to that, I think. Okay, love it, love it. Yeah. David Burry, the most picked artist on this podcast to date, 15th time he makes his Fantasy Festival appearance. He's going to play an hour and a half as your pre-headline act. So we'll take one more half-hour break. That'll take us to half past eight. Your headline act going to get two and a half hours to bring reincarnation to its conclusion. So, Joe, who is your Fantasy Festival headliner? It's it's the man from Minneapolis, isn't it? It's got to be Prince. Um, I one of my regrets is not ever seeing him live, but uh, the, the way that he produced music, it, it, his, he was just a one-man band, and, and to know that nearly, you know, half the instrumentation on his albums was done by himself, you know, and he was he was a great drummer. I I, I, I annoy a lot of the guitarists when I say this, but I believe he is the best guitarist who ever existed, and for fuck's sake, he had the best voice as well. So I mean, if you've got both those skills, in um, then you. You deserve the headline slot in my fantasy festival, that's for sure. Yeah. And he gets it, and he gets it. So Prince gets your headline slot, seventh time he's been picked for a fantasy festival. I never got to see Prince either, Joe. I came awfully close to the point where I had two tickets in my basket to go and see him at the Roundhouse, and I, for some reason, released them because it was like an early show, and I thought I can't really get there for half five. But in hindsight, probably one of the worst musical decisions I've ever made. But there you go. I feel your pain. There you go. So Prince will play from half eight to 11. It's going to be an epic set. Then at 11 o'clock, he brings back on stage David Bowie, Talk Talk, Elbow, and Public Service Broadcasting, and they get to play any song of your choice. So you've already alluded to the artist song who they're going to play, but Joe, what's going to be your encore? What track are you going to have him play? It, it not necessarily Bowie's um, best song, but but his best anthem, which is Heroes, and uh, it, it needs no explaining as far as I can see, because it, it could be one that, that everybody joins in on the chorus, uh, and it would have the whole crowd singing, so it would be that one. Great shout, great shout. Great way to bring a fantastic fantasy festival lineup to its conclusion so let's lock it in joe so you can still change your mind up until the point of where we're locking it in which we're doing now so we've got reincarnation we're going to rio brazil for this one in your opening act we've got public service broadcasting super seconds we've got elbow midway madness we've got talk talk pre-headline act is david burry prince is your headliner we actually haven't got an album to play in full do you want an album played in full or are you swerving the opportunity oh, um I, yeah, I'm going to go, this will be it. I'm going to say um, The Colour of Spring by Talk Talk. And it, it isn't my favourite album by them, but it also has the, the, the most um, uplifting songs on it, which uh, I think enough people in the audience would know to sing along. So that would be the album that I'd like to hear uh, in br- full. Brilliant stuff. So Colour of Spring, Talk Talk. And for your encore, all five acts are going to play Heroes together to close your fantasy festival. Joe? Are you happy to lock this one into the Fantastical Vaults? Lock it in, Steve. Brilliant. Great stuff. That is done and that is in the vaults of the Fantastical. So, Joe, before we round this one up, what do the next few months look like for you? So, obviously, you've spoken about the new album that's coming out streaming on December the 6th and is already on Bandcamp. You've already said that you've got an album, the next album, already done. But I guess in the next six months to a year, what what are you, what are you hoping that happens for Joe? Well, I, 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 the, the, the next album... I'm massively enthusiastic about because you know you you read out the the, the way that Bandcamp described the previous one, which was I had a six month period was I, I was quite obsessed with with those sort of synth sounds that came from that 80s sort of era. But what the next album has got, it's got a guy called Jim Sanger playing guitar on about two thirds of the tracks. And Jim Jim is someone I've known since school. Uh, he's he does um, soundtracks for a lot of independent films 
uh, and an enormous amount of library music. He, so he's got his fingers in many pies, but he also is a really brilliant instrumentalist. So I've been working very closely with Jim um, over the internet, and he's added a dimension that I, I really couldn't couldn't ask for more. So the next six months, and you do hope, you hope that one or two gatekeepers relent because ultimately that's what every um, independent musician who hasn't got a deal is one is just hoping that maybe this once maybe this time this album will have that power and depth to catch the attention of someone who is in a position to actually make something more of your music and give it more exposure and and i know we always say this but this album has on it i think about seven or eight songs which are strong, strong songs, and 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 that's that sort of self hubris. Yeah, I apologise. I'm sorry. I can only say that by sounding arrogant. But and it, and and a lot of it is down to Jim because I am not a, a very good guitarist. In fact, most of the guitar you will hear on previous albums is me cheating. I, it, quite often, I can't play all the chord. I will I'll do two guitar tracks and merge them both. I'll tune the guitar so that it can be played more easily by myself. And um, whereas what Jim brings is 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 a he's a very high level uh, instrumentalist. So when people hear the tunes with with a, a, a rockier edge, as far as I, it, 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 there's 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 still kind of poppy rock. Uh, I'm trying to make sure there's many earworms that I can cram in as possible. But it, it's working. And I've also worked with someone else called Skylu, who's a very talented um, singer from London, uh, and she's she's helped out with one, another track that we've done. So we've got another person to introduce there. So that's it. I'm gonna I'm gonna see how that pans out. Probably put it out. Uh, yeah, sort of springtime, maybe March, and from that point onwards, uh, I, I have no idea. Just make it up as I go along, Steve. I, I honestly <laughs> don't. Hopefully, get a few a decent sort of jobs from from bands that are seeking a little bit of help on the mixing front or production. But yeah, the day job is back with a vengeance. Bring back twenty twenty and twenty one. That's what I'm saying. I've enjoyed all that <laughs> spare time, but. So, well, I'll cram in what I can, but it's not going to be as, as productive as um, previous years, that's for sure. Great stuff. So let's go and plug in where the music is. So you can be found on Bandcamp primarily, so we send people to Bandcamp as a starting point to go and find Yeah, I, but Bandcamp is, um, is uh, you're going to find, if you want to make a bigger impact in the lives of the people that you enjoy the music of, Bandcamp is where you go, uh, and, uh, and it's as simple as that. Um, and, and it's a gesture for some people, and, and I appreciate we are in a cost of living crisis, but if you are someone who is blessed to have a few spare quid floating around each month and you're into your music, go to Bandcamp. It's, you know, it, tweeting the fact that they've just released something on Spotify is nice, but it's not gonna it's not gonna help them invest in the next sort of guitar strings or, you know, new guitar or the ability to be able to go and play their next gig. So um Bandcamp's where it's at. It, it's a, it is a gesture because admittedly you could get almost the same product by listening to on Spotify. But hopefully, you know, if enough people buy a download for Fiverr or something like that, they can consider putting it out on C D or vinyl. Um so that's 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 I could I'm I'm a massive gobshite about um a band camp and then they've done me a massive favour because they 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 put my album on their website and um I, I've got a lot of repayment and to throw back their their way and I think everybody should be shouting about it. Great shout, great shout. And if anyone wants to find you on socials, Joe, where are you on socials? Where can people find you if they want to keep up to date with the album and, and future releases and anything that's going on? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm pretty much mainly Twitter. I, I'm. 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 Facebook is just just a sea of red numbers to me, and Instagram. I'm just an idiot. I wouldn't even know where to start. I, I've done a couple of TikToks, but yeah, and and because I've got a weird name like yourself, it's I'm quite easy to find. It's just spell my name out, and I'll be there for you in, on the social media. Yeah. Great stuff, great stuff. So if you don't follow Joe already, make sure you do. And make sure if you're not on Bandcamp, but you're on Spotify, go and stream the album. And if you are on Bandcamp, go and check out Joe's page because it's fantastic. So that is it, everyone. If you've enjoyed this one and uh, thank you for doing so, you can give the Fantastical Podcast a review or you can subscribe on iTunes or you give us a follow on Spotify where you can rate the show or on Anchor, and recommend this podcast to all your friends and families. Joe is on Twitter, so is the podcast, so make sure to give us a follow if you don't already at P, or you can also email 
the podcast at fantasticalpodcast at outlook.com. Unfortunately, we don't play music on this podcast, but I'll get some tracks from Joe from his chosen artist and maybe a few from Joe of stuff he's produced or anything else he wants to throw in there. And we'll put that playlist in the episode description. So, Joe, you've been my 113th guest, probably from the most far away anyone's ever done a fantastical podcast. So, I thank you, sir. How have you found kind of coming on and talking about your music and production and your fantasy festival? Do you know, the one thing I've got to hand to you, um, Steve, is that you've got you've just said number one hundred and thirteen. That's a, an, an enormous amount of staying power because there are a lot of people of during lockdown started up podcasts, but they're all sort of withering away, uh, and you are still at it. So I'm just going to give you a, a round of applause for for sticking with it with this format, which is a winning format. So well done. I'm. Um, um, it's hard following um, A.D. Hansen, you know, because we all know he's a bit of a legend. But have I enjoyed it? Oh, well, you've made me think, you know, when you have to make lists about what is your favourite, I I'm, I struggle. Um, and I'm, if you ask me the same question in a month's time, I'm sure it will be yeah. completely different. But thanks for giving me um, the opportunity to have a, a long, hard think about who exactly I would pick for, for that sort of format. No, great shout. You've been a great guest, Joe, and I've really enjoyed speaking to you. Best of luck with About the Soul, and I look forward to listening to that and the album that comes out in 2023. I'm excited to listen. To I'll give one. you an advanced listen, mate. I'll give you an oh, advanced great listen. Great stuff, great stuff, Joe. So I'll be back next week with episode number 114, the last podcast of 2022. So please make sure to join me. But until then, stay safe, my fantastical friends. Please continue to spread the word. And that word is fantastical. Thanks for listening.